Hi, I'm Ellie Anderson. And I'm David Peña Guzman. Welcome to Overthink. The podcast where two friends who are also professors put philosophy in dialogue with the everyday. Because big ideas are within everyone's reach. Before we get into today's episode, we just want to say that you'll hear us sometimes use words like crazy or insane. We hope it's clear from the context that what we're referring to is accusations that people are crazy or insane and not that we buy into the use of those terms, which are ableist in nature. We also want to provide a content warning because in today's episode, we discuss sexual violence and birth trauma. They come up in the second half of the episode. It seems like everybody these days is talking about gaslighting. It's one of those rare terms that is hot within academia and outside of it at the same time. Usually it's one or the other, right? Either academics are super ahead of popular discourse or super behind it. But right now, magically, they are in sync. And the synchronization is happening over gaslighting. I know, it's wild. There's been a spate of academic journal issues and conferences devoted to the topic. But then you also have like a lot of popular op-eds and Instagram memes about it. Yeah, for instance, in 2016, Lauren Duca wrote a piece for Teen Vogue, which, by the way, has been killing it recently with their political consciousness <laughs> approach to reaching out Absolutely. to teens who are interested in fashion. And uh, she wrote a piece called Donald Trump is Gaslighting America, in which she enumerates all the tactics of social control and social manipulation used by Donald Trump and interprets them as a political form of gaslighting. Yeah, and it's interesting you mentioned that as an example, in part because I do think that that article had a lot of impact on the popularity of gaslighting, and also because I think it's no coincidence that the term gaslighting has gotten so much uptake during the Trump administration, because he was a gaslighter in chief, <laughs> right? Like, I'm sure others have said the same thing. But in any case, I do worry that sometimes gaslighting gets used so broadly that it no longer means anything at all. So in the case of Trump, absolutely. Absolutely. He's a gaslighter. However, I sometimes hear people accuse others of gaslighting them simply when they disagree with them, right? It's like, oh, your interpretation of what happened is different than mine. Therefore, you're gaslighting me. Well, I don't know that I agree with that. You are gaslighting me right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, actually, I mean, the real tea is that I was at a gaslighting conference and one of the conference participants accused another one of gaslighting her. But that is a whole different story. Well, that is so meta. Academics accusing academics of gaslighting them at a conference on gaslighting. I think this is kind of like <laughs> a skit for a spoof of academics. <laughs> Yeah, and I didn't really know what to make of that situation exactly, but just to say, it, yeah, it was very meta. Today, we're talking about gaslighting. What is gaslighting? And who gaslights whom? How does gaslighting harm individuals, undermining their very grip on reality? And how does it function more broadly in cultural settings, through intersections of race, culture, gender, and the like? Let's find out. The term gaslighting originates from the 1938 play, which was turned into a movie in 1944, called Gaslight, which starred Ingrid Bergman. In this story, a husband psychologically tortures his wife by convincing her she is insane. He dims the lights in the home, which is why it's entitled Gaslight, but he convinces her that she's delusional when she asks whether it's gotten darker. Yeah, and beyond the lights, he does all kinds of things to this poor woman to mentally terrorize her and convince her that she's somehow unwell. So, for example, he will steal things that belong to her and hide them and then tell her that her memory is slipping away. Or he also will hide his things in her belongings, like in her purse, as a way of convincing her that she blacks out at random moments and starts stealing things. And there is this very powerful scene where he takes her to a fancy party and makes a big display of her kleptomania by finding his watch in her purse, which, of course, he had planted there, put there. all along. And it really is a form of mental terrorism. And there's a scene from the movie that I think really exemplifies the mental terrorism that's going on. So let's check it out. If I could only get inside that brain of yours and understand what makes you do these crazy, twisted things. 
Gregory, are you trying to tell me I'm insane? It's what I'm trying not to tell myself. But that's what you think, isn't it? That's what you've been hinting and suggesting for months now, ever since... Hmm? Since what? Since the day I lost your brooch. Yes. Your mother was mad. Oh, Gregory. She died in an asylum when you were a year old. That's not true. I've talked to the doctor who attended her. You'd like to see him? No. He described her symptoms to me. Do you like to hear them? Um, it began with her imagining things, that she heard noises, footsteps, voices. And then the voices began to speak to her. And in the end, she died in an asylum with no brain at all. No, please. Oh, no, no. David, what strikes you about this clip? For a long time, I've had an interest in the philosophy of dreams and the difference between the dream world and the waking world. And here you see that being weaponized through the man's claim that this woman can no longer judge the difference between when she is awake and when she's in a dream. So she enters these trance-like states over which she has zero executive control. Yeah. Another thing that strikes me here is his claim towards the beginning that he is really concerned that she might be going insane and that he doesn't want to have to come to the conclusion that she's experiencing delusions, but he's forced to, right? And so there's this way that he's manipulating her, not by saying like, oh yeah, you're crazy, but by saying, oh, I hate to come to this conclusion, but I feel I have no choice. And as if it's him who is the victim of circumstances because he married a woman not knowing truly who she is. And earlier before this clip, there are a few scenes in which he does precisely that. He accuses her of having deceived him by not having told him that, you know, she suffers from whatever condition he believes that she suffers. And he constantly threatens to take her to the doctor. And that charge that, you're the one deceiving me is a very troubling one. And it's part of what makes gaslighting so difficult for those experiencing it because it's hard to argue with somebody and say, no, I'm not deceiving you because then they're just going to say, well, that's further proof that you're deceiving me, right? There's this way that this charge of you're deceiving me further serves to make her question, well, am I deceiving him? Because she's in good faith, right? Gaslighting trades on the gaslightee's good faith. Yeah, and in fact, there are several points in the movie where she comes to believe that she has stolen the brooch, that she has stolen the watch, or she has lost the letter, all these objects that become the placeholders for gaslighting. And another thing that I find quite interesting about this clip is the reference to the mother. The fact that her mother was already unwell and so there's already good evidence, you know, in this case from biology yeah. and maybe genetics that she has the same fate as her mother. Exactly. So putting her insanity in the context of a family curse or a family malady serves to further this idea that, well, yeah, you're probably just the same way. And it's inevitable that you will end up in an asylum, which again is mm -hmm. what gets uh, held over her as the ultimate threat, which in the 1940s and what we know about the history of psychology through the 19th century and early 20th century was a very real danger for women. Oh, yeah. With things like hysteria. Yeah, exactly. The term gaslighting originally appeared in the context of women trapped in abusive relationships with men, as in the case of gaslight. Feminists nowadays use it to talk about a specific way in which women are oppressed by men, namely by having their understanding of their surroundings manipulated, again, typically in the context of a sexual or romantic dynamic. Yeah, and we'll talk a little bit later about the detailed psychological dynamics of this manipulation. But for now, let's try and define gaslighting. The definition of gaslighting doesn't inherently pertain to the oppression of women by men. One definition of gaslighting that I find useful is that of philosopher Veronica Ivey, who writes that gaslighting is a form of epistemic injustice in which a knower is called to question their own reality. And as its name indicates, epistemic injustice has to do with epistemology, which is the theory of knowledge. And it captures those acts of violence or injustice that harm somebody not so much physically or even emotionally, but rather in their capacity as knowers by targeting what they know, how they know it, and how much certainty they have in the fact that they know it. 
So gaslighting as an epistemic injustice is a harm, right? It's something that's like wrong. You shouldn't do it to people and you shouldn't accept it if it's done to you. However, the second half of the definition, I think, really points to the complexity of gaslighting. The idea that a knower is called to question their own reality. Usually philosophers, as well as curious folks in general, think that the idea of questioning our reality is a good thing, right? We want to be challenged. We recognize that we don't live as solitary minds in the universe and that other people might have perceptions of things that are more accurate than our own, or at least are different and worth considering. And so what is it about gaslighting? How can we figure out when our questioning our own reality is an epistemic harm rather than just like an invitation to be curious about something we didn't know already? Yeah, and I think the way philosophers will answer that question is by emphasizing that there is a meaningful difference between questioning specific aspects of your reality, like your belief in A, B, or C, and losing your grip over that which makes your entire reality hang together as one. So there's a difference between questioning particulars and taking the rug out from under your feet, epistemologically speaking. Yeah, but I think there are also some times when it's good to have the rug taken out from under you. For instance, like when I teach introduction to philosophy and I encourage students to question their sort of like dogmatic reception of science and believing that if anything has a study behind it, it's suddenly right. And so I guess I'm I'm still left wondering what makes gaslighting gaslighting. And this is also, David, like mm-hmm. this is a genuine question. I yes. like I really wonder this. Yeah. And it's really difficult. One way in which I think about it is that one of the targets of gaslighting is our subjective faculties rather than the contents that those faculties make available to us. So when we think about the faculties of a subject, things like memory, imagination, rationality, what gaslighting does above all is that it convinces people that they can no longer rely on their typical modes of going about the world and acquiring knowledge about the world so that they no longer have faith in themselves or in their capacity to know anything with any degree of certainty. So everything is suddenly up for question. And I think we can agree that when everything is up for question without the possibility of any kind of grounding, then we have a problem. I mean, I think you're on to something there, but by that definition, somebody like Socrates, who famously said, what makes me wise is that I know that I don't know anything, (laughs) would be the victim of gaslighting. So I would be inclined less to define gaslighting in terms of its ability to make somebody question their own reality and more in terms of sort of identifying further what the epistemic injustice that Ivy mentions is. And One way that I think about the epistemic injustice there or the harm that's done to somebody who's being gaslit is that when they question their own reality, that questioning is manipulated and used by another person in order to further undermine them and give them no potential for actually coming to knowledge of something. So it's like a refusal to engage with the person who's questioning their own reality, sort of like on equal footing and instead using their doubt and saying, oh yes, you doubt that. You should doubt all of these other things as well. It's like an opportunity that they're taking advantage of. I don't don't know if that really gets us very far either, though. Well, I mean, by that definition, then Socrates himself would be also potentially a gaslighter. A gaslighter? Yeah, I mean, because that's what he does, right? He (laughs) goes around Athens constantly making people question all their beliefs and claiming that he himself has no positive beliefs in anything. He's just the master of the method of questioning. But there is never really a point in Socrates' life at which he questions his own ability to reason and to argue, right? He's fully committed to the idea that he is the smartest person in the world, which is what the Oracle told them, right? He goes to the Oracle and the Oracle of Delphi says, there is no person smarter than Socrates. And he sort of eats it up and runs with it. So his own ability to reason is never in question. Okay. And, you know, taking this example of Socrates as potential gaslighter in a slightly different direction, I think what's interesting is that we made a case that maybe Socrates should be understood as both a victim of gaslighting and as a gaslighter, which, like, I definitely do not want to, you know, stake a claim about that. (laughs) Just more like a sort of silly thought experiment. But I think this does get at an interesting question which is the status of the gaslighter 
My sense is that a lot of gaslighting happens in cycles where somebody who is gaslighting has also been gaslit themselves and is using those manipulation tactics on other people. Or maybe even like in some cases, the same people can gaslight each other and also be gaslit by each other. I'm not sure about that. But I do think that this raises the very important issue of whether gaslighting is deliberate or not. Does a gaslighter need to know that they are doing the gaslighting? Well, I'm curious about your thoughts about this. What would an accidental, unintentional form of gaslighting look like? So one of the examples that comes to mind, remaining within the scope of individual relations to each other, so leaving aside for now structural, racial, and cultural gaslighting, which we'll talk about a little bit later, I'm reminded of the example that Veronica Ivy gives in her piece, Allies Behaving Badly, which is about how cisgender allies of trans folks sometimes gaslight those trans folks. And Ivy distinguishes between what she calls a psychological form of gaslighting, which is what we see in the movie Gaslight. It's a Mm -hmm. deliberate form of psychological warfare. And what she calls a more subtle, often unintentional form of gaslighting. And this she describes as occurring when a listener doesn't believe a speaker's testimony. And this is due to the speaker having a credibility deficit due to an identity stereotype or a prejudice. So for instance, the accusation that a white man might make of a black woman who's experiencing racism in the workplace and is already at a deficit because black women's knowledge is not valorized in the way that white men's knowledge is. And so when she says, I'm experiencing racism in the workplace, he doubts her simply by virtue of the fact that he has this narrative of like, well, of course she would see things that aren't there because she would be seeing a racism that doesn't exist by virtue of her own black womanhood. In that case, I definitely agree with you that gaslighting can be unintentional and it can be subtle. So it's kind of the death by a thousand paper cuts form of gaslighting. (laughs) Uh, So it's more like gas matching, (laughs) where just like little matches being lit over and over again. Gas matching? Yeah, I just made that term (laughs) up to contrast it with the more intentional kind of centralized approach that we see in the movie. I, I don't know. I don't know about that term, David. Maybe yeah, like also just doesn't work. You don't, you don't need gas for matches. No. <laughs> so maybe it's light matching. Light anyway. Match. match lighting. Match lighting is the right one. Um, or paper clipping. Okay. Okay. Touche. Uh, paper cutting. Paper cutting <laughs> would be better. <laughs> well, because of the death by a thousand paper cuts. Anyhow, uh, moving away from my unreliable metaphorical faculty, what I like about this unintentional, non-deliberative way of thinking about gaslighting is that it puts gaslighting in dialogue with other concepts that have been relatively useful for people doing anti-racist, anti-sexist work, and so on like the concept of implicit bias or the concept of unconscious prejudices, whereby our acts and our behaviors, even unbeknownst to ourselves, are already slanted in particular ways by virtue of the culture of which we are a part. Yeah. And so I like the way that you put that because I think you're right that gaslighting helps us, for instance, understand what's going on with microaggressions, which are little behaviors or statements that serve to stereotype and or devalue people in different situations. And if someone experiences a lot of microaggressions and then calls that situation what it is, and the people who have been perpetrating the microaggressions are like, what? We didn't do anything, right? I think it's fair game to call that gaslighting because you are undermining a person's perception and sense of reality. So I think the expansion of gaslighting to include forms of manipulation or behaviors that aren't deliberate is really important because it helps us make sense of things like that. But I also wonder whether it's a double-edged sword because then it leaves us open to all of these very complicated adjudications of whose reality is right. And that doesn't seem to me to be so much a problem with something like microaggressions in the workplace, because I would simply say, hey, the Black woman who's experiencing microaggressions has more authority to talk about the microaggressions she's experiencing than the white man. And so I like, I feel pretty comfortable with saying who's in the right there. But there are a lot of other cases, for instance, interpersonal relationships where people are manipulating one another, where The reality of the situation may not be super clear cut, and it's really hard to figure out when people are co-constituting a given situation whose interpretation is right, especially when people are accusing each other of gaslighting. Yeah, but I think when we're talking about gaslighting, we're going beyond merely having 
interpersonal conflict that is part and parcel of living together or being part of the same community, we are talking about a harmful way of affecting other people's realities, again, by making them come to question things that as subjects they are entitled not to question. So I still want to hold on to a distinction between those more general forms of interpersonal conflict and what we might call gaslighting, even if, of course, like with every distinction, the in-between is a little bit gray and porous. Yeah, and I think when theorists of gaslighting are talking about gaslighting, they're usually doing so in a way that refers to what Karen Adkins describes as wreaking significant epistemic and moral damages through small, often invisible actions. So there is something extraordinarily intense about gaslighting. And I just wonder whether that's a little bit at odds with some of the ways that gaslighting gets thrown around in everyday discourse today. And what these theorists are also recognizing is that in spite of their diversity, gaslighting tactics follow recognizable patterns. So they fall into certain types or into certain categories that allow us to classify them, to name them, and to come to better understand their internal mechanics. For instance, the philosopher Cynthia Stark argues that gaslighting often involves two tactics, which she calls sidestepping and displacing. And we know that it involves a lot of other tactics that have other names, but these two in particular stand out for her. Sidestepping is dodging evidence that supports the testimony of the victim. So when the woman says, no, you are making me believe all these things that are not real, the gaslighter will simply change the subject or simply dodge the issue. Now, what Stark calls displacing is a slightly different tactic, which entails attributing defects in thinking or perceiving or remembering or just character flaws in general to the victim. So, for instance, your memory is fading. We know that you can't really think rationally because, you know, it runs in your family or whatever the case might be. And according to her, these strategies appear again and again in cases of gaslighting. Well, and that's so helpful, actually, David, because I do think that helps resolve some of my worries about the leaky nature of the concept gaslighting, because I think it's really important to locate the mechanism of gaslighting in the way that the gaslighter responds to the victims questioning their own reality, right? Rather than like gaslighting just happening on the side of the victim or on the side of the perpetrator. We have this relational dimension here. And so these two tactics of sidestepping and displacing, I think are really useful because once we see one of those, rather than a genuine engagement or reckoning with the victim's reality, that's when we have a case of gaslighting rather than a simple disagreement about a state of affairs. Yeah, and so if I'm fighting with my roommate and I say, hey, roommate, let's sit down because you're doing all these things that are bothering me and we have to process it so that we can live together, what my roommate ideally will do is listen to what I have to say and then work with me in trying to resolve it. And even if they don't quite agree on the details, they might say, look, I'm sorry that you're feeling this way. I just see it differently. Even that is something that the gaslighter will never do because the gaslighter will always adopt a unilateral interpretation of who is at fault. And that's never them. Exactly. Yeah. There's like no recognition of the relational co-constitution of the situation. And I also just want to say that I think I have now decided that Socrates is not a gaslighter because sidestepping and displacing are not tactics he uses. He wants to get into the meat of the conflict. We can think about the psychology of gaslighting from two different, although related, angles. That of the perpetrator, who is doing the gaslighting, and that of the victim, who is at the receiving end of it. I want us to talk about both of these angles, but let's start with the psychology of the victim. Yeah, I think most women are probably familiar with the experience of being called crazy, right? Yeah, definitely. And I by no means want to say that all women experience gaslighting in the same way, right? That would be a horribly non-intersectional approach. <laughs> but I do think it's very common for women to get called crazy. 
and this being used to undermine their authority. And um, not not speaking from personal experience or anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think what happens in gaslighting is that it's not just about undermining somebody's authority, but it's also about undermining their very sense of reality. So as you said earlier, David, it's like you're not just having something you believe questioned. You're having the rug pulled out from under you entirely. So gaslighting serves to make people doubt their perception of events. And it's a successful tool of manipulation because it leads the victim to adopt the gaslighter's perspective over their own. Partly because the gaslighter just seems so confident that they are right and that the victim is wrong. Yeah. And again, it goes all the way to making victims believe that they can no longer adjudicate the difference between the dream world and the real world, which to me just highlights how deep gaslighting cuts, because that's probably one of the most fundamental distinctions that we need just to function in the world, right? To know that, hey, this this is reality yeah. now. And this is exactly what happens in that movie, uh, Rosemary's Baby. This is like another example of gaslighting oh. in film. Because in that- I hadn't thought about it that way. Yeah, so in that film, the main woman, Rosemary, is raped by the devil in her sleep. And then she kind of wakes up in the middle of it and has this weird kind of half memory, half dreamlike experience of it. And when she wakes up, she asks her husband, like, what happened last night? And he's like, oh, yeah, you and I had sex. Um, it was me the whole time. You were just kind of not really awake and not really asleep. And uh, then meanwhile, she's got the oh, devil's baby yeah. inside her. Oh, my God. Yeah. And I think gaslighting around sexual violence is just so rampant. That is where the banality of evil exists. In this idea that women are constantly led to believe, well, you probably asked for it or what were you wearing, right? That's a form of gaslighting the victim, precisely using that tool that you talked about from Cynthia Stark, which is the tool of displacing, attributing to a defect in character what happened to the victim. And the case of sexual violence highlights what we've described as the epistemic harm associated with gaslighting. And it brings to the fore that credibility deficit from which women suffer under patriarchy. Because what we know from these cases is that systematically when women say, I have been raped, I have been sexually harassed, I've been sexually assaulted, people don't believe it. They just don't think that it is true. Um, and this includes school counselors, this includes judges, this includes police officers, it includes even family members. And so it brings to the fore yeah. that epistemological dimension about who knows what and under what conditions. Yeah, because women already aren't believed as much as men are in society. And, you know, a different aspect of the psychology of being gaslit turns on isolating the victim from their support network. So for instance, a lot of perpetrators of gaslighting, especially when gaslighting is happening in the context of intimate relationships that are abusive, will tell the victim's friends and family members that this person is just going through a difficult time, right? This is one way that perpetrators get to seem like they're in the right because they're just looking out for the person, right? Like, oh, it's so terrible. She's just being a little crazy right now or she's going through a hard time telling the victim's friends and family, I'm really looking out for her, is a version of concern trolling. This idea that like you're trolling somebody by feigning concern for them. Yeah, and that happens in the film over and over again, where the guy will say, I don't want to send you to the asylum. But again, I might have to for your own well-being. Yes. And I want to return to the point that we made about how this is carried out through microaggressions. Because in many cases, all of these microaggressions that, again, add to this concern trolling are hidden or, in many cases, passed off as jokes. And I find the yes. weaponization of humor in particular to be an important element for understanding the psychology of gaslighting because its ultimate goal really is to convince the victim that they are overreactive as a way of, in fact, rendering them over accepting, right? If you break somebody down mm, by convincing uh -huh. them that any kind of resistance they might put up is evidence of their fragility, then you, in fact, render them fragile. And they will take all the bullshit that you want to throw their way. Yes. And I think that's such a great example of the way that the victim ends up feeling totally broken down in character. They not only don't trust themselves, but they actually lose a sense of themselves entirely and sort of end up 
needing to glom on to the perpetrator's view of reality and maybe also their identity just to have some sort of life raft. And your comments about how the victim is isolated points to the impossibility of finding that raft. In the movie, the woman is isolated in every imaginable way by her husband. He will hide her mail, letters that her family send her expressing concern about her well-being. He will intercept them and then tell her that they're not writing to her. He will also convince the housekeepers that she is accusing them of doing the stealing, which is not true, as a way of, again, alienating her from the other people in the house. Wow. So all around from the beginning to the end of the movie, phenomenologically speaking, this woman just experiences the walls closing in on her from every possible angle until she's alone in the middle of the ocean without a life raft. Yeah. And I think the idea of alone is complex here because on the one hand, you're absolutely right that the victim is isolated and cut off from her support system. At the same time, in a sense, she's not alone because she doesn't even have her own personal identity or integrity as an individual anymore, right? She's like just a shell of a human or just like reduced to a puddle that becomes part of the puddle of the perpetrator. All right, we're into weird what, <laughs> metaphors here now. <laughs> no, but I think the idea of being alienated, not just from others, but also from yourself is captured really beautifully and really powerfully in the short story, The Yellow Wallpaper, in which this one woman, again, is gaslit by her husband, and she just slowly recedes into the background, becoming part of the wallpaper. So she is yes, not just that early feminist classic story. Yes. And so she just sort of blends into her surroundings, disappearing like a ghost. Yeah, that's a really interesting connection. What do you think is happening on the perpetrator's side while all of this is happening to the victim? Well, I mean... Beyond the fact that they're POSs, I'm not sure where to take this in a philosophically rigorous manner. But when I think about gaslighters, it's true that I do think about the classical case of the manipulating husband who pulls the strings in a choreographed, orchestrated way. But I also think about the more subtle, unintentional, maybe even unconscious forms of gaslighting that we talked about earlier. And I think the lightness of the aggressions, their microness, is absolutely essential for understanding the psychology of the perpetrator because it allows them to not cross a certain threshold, which is typically physical violence or verbal violence, so that you can in fact have certainly the mastermind approach to gaslighting, uh, where you're executing a strategy that maybe you've planned ahead of time. But then you also have, again, those men who in the process of gaslighting truly convince themselves that they're not really gaslighters. They're just nice guys who are trying to look out for the well-being of the women around them. And I think the latter are just as dangerous as the former. So gaslighters are often trying to turn their victim into their fantasy of what the victim should be. I think what's happening a lot with gaslighters is a denial of another person's autonomy. They, they might not even actually realize that they want to deny somebody else's autonomy. They just think that they have a grasp on reality complete hold on it. They're what philosophers call solipsists. And the psychologist Eleanor Greenberg writes about this dimension of gaslighting as changing the victim, which can sometimes take a literal form. So like demanding that they change their hair, their dress, their mannerisms, all of which are really classic signals of domestic abuse. But it can also take subtler forms of wanting to change their personality, their values, and that sort of thing. Yeah. All these disorienting tactics. Yeah. It's like Men, as a class, we suffer from a Pygmalion syndrome, right? We want to create these fantasies in our <laughs> image, and uh, we get off on the idea that we have that shaping power. When you're talking about this, David, all I have in my head is that Chicks song, Gaslighter, which goes, Gaslighter, denier. And I will stop there and let listeners now have it in their head for the rest of the episode, <laughs> if you've heard it. If you haven't, maybe check Wait, it out. Wait, is that a recent song? Yeah, they came out with an album called Gaslighter in, what was it, like 2019? Oh, what? Also, who are the chicks? 2020. <laughs> oh, formerly the Dixie Chicks. They changed their oh. name because it was racist. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. It's like uh, Lady Antebellum and Lady A. <laughs> exactly. Lady A. <laughs> um, speaking of racism, let's talk about racial gaslighting, cultural gaslighting, and other forms of structural gaslighting. If you're enjoying Overthink, 
please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. So as we've discussed, the term gaslighting originated in the context of abusive romantic relationships between men and women. But a lot of theorists have realized that the term describes a much wider phenomenon, transcending its original context and applying not just to individuals, but actually to social groups. And I'm thinking here about recent articles on gaslighting, including Nora Berenstein's article on structural gaslighting, which is called White Feminist Gaslighting, and Elena Ruiz's concept of cultural gaslighting. So how do they define those terms? So structural gaslighting, as Berenstein describes it, basically obscures the connections between structures of oppression and the patterns of harm that are related to them. So for instance, going back to that example earlier about a Black woman who's experiencing microaggressions in the workplace and sees that as part of a broader system of racial domination, that woman is gaslit if HR or her boss or whomever fails to recognize that the harms being done to her are part of a long history of anti-Black racism in the U.S. and makes it seem like what's actually a political problem is just a personal problem. So is structural gaslighting then the same as cultural gaslighting? No. Structural gaslighting is broader than cultural gaslighting because you can have structures that don't say relate to culture, at least as far as I understand it. But Ruiz defines cultural gaslighting as social and historical support mechanisms that basically produce abusive mental environments within settler colonial structures. And these end up furthering the ends of cultural genocide and dispossession. So they basically encourage colonized folks to think that they're deserving of colonization and to erase entire histories of oppression and genocide. Yeah, and because these concepts of structural and cultural gaslighting shift our focus from the individual to the broader social structures and cultural patterns that shape our lives, again, without our conscious intention, they help us make sense of multiple forms of discrimination and not just discrimination on the basis of sex, as it appears originally in that movie and the first wave of scholarly research on gaslighting. For example, the philosopher of disability Shelley Tremaine wrote an essay about gaslighting in connection to disability in which she applies this concept of structural gaslighting to what we call mental illness and the ways in which people typically deemed mad, quote unquote, are gaslit by the very medical establishment that creates the categories of mental illness and mental health, putting them into these boxes on account of not being neurotypical. And there is a quote in her essay that I want to cite because I think it captures the essence of her argument. She writes, People who, for any number of reasons, do not conform to highly regulated standards of, for instance, social behavior and interaction, such as people who are classified as quote-unquote mentally ill or perceived to be insane, are routinely discredited, ignored, vilified, and stigmatized. Until the relatively recent formation and rise of the mad pride movement and related social movements, the hermeneutical resources that many disabled people required to collectively understand the political character of their situation were unavailable to them. And I think Tremaine's point about gaslighting in the context of disability provides a point of conversation with feminist accounts of gaslighting in the medical establishment, or what is called medical gaslighting. It's very well documented that women are often not believed as much as men are when they report their pain or other medical ailments. And this is especially a problem for fat women who are often distrusted in their own accounts of pain and other medical ailments, and also women of color, especially black women. You can't talk about about the medical establishment in the U.S. without talking about the history of horrific terrors that have been perpetrated against Black women, especially enslaved Black women, who then were also gaslit and made to think that their pain wasn't real or that their injuries were imagined. Yes, I recently read an article precisely about this that was published in the Journal of Law, Medicine, and Ethics in 2001, which argues that, for example, women, and they did not control for race, so it talks about women as a category rather than, say, Black women, are under-prescribed painkillers because doctors typically assume that they're being overly dramatic and catastrophic. So women presenting with the same symptoms as men will simply be told that, oh, you know, it's 
probably in your head. Maybe you're just stressed out. Maybe it's not as big of a deal as you're making it out to be. So here, take a Tylenol and you'll be fine in a couple of days. Yeah, and this is especially a problem for Black women because historically, racial pseudoscience from the 18th and 19th centuries literally believed that Black people had higher pain thresholds than white folks. For instance, this was one reason that chattel slavery was justified. It's like, oh, well, they don't experience pain in the same way that white people do. They can stay out in the sun longer than white people can. And this led to things like Black enslaved women being experimented on without anesthesia. Well, and in connection to this, I think it's important for us to recognize that this is not only historical, it continues in the present, because researchers have found that even today, more than 50% of med school graduates will say yes to the question of whether Black people's skin is slightly thicker than white people's skin. So we're talking about 21st century people who are going into medicine as doctors having easily refutable beliefs about the science of race. Oh my God. It's just unconscionable. I'm also thinking here about Black women's mortality rates in pregnancy and childbirth. Black women are three to four times more likely to be at risk of pregnancy-related deaths than white women are. I think this really came to the fore a couple of years ago when Serena Williams almost died in childbirth. Williams has a history of developing blood clots, and she developed one after giving birth to her daughter. When Williams went to the hospital for this, for severe symptoms, including coughing that was so intense that she ripped her C-section wound, she was not taken seriously by the nurse. And this is particularly egregious in the case of Serena Williams, because as a world-class athlete, she knows her body better than like anybody else, right? And so the idea that a nurse would not take her account of what was going on seriously is particularly damning. She knew that she had a history of blood clots. She told the nurse, hey, I think I know what's going on. But the nurse thought that Williams' pain medication might have been confusing her. So basically, Serena Williams ultimately recovered, but medical gaslighting almost led to her death. Yeah, it's like, oh, Serena Williams, you're telling me all these facts about your medical history? You are dreaming. This is nothing but a dream. You know, it's like weird racial Houdiniism uh, within the medical establishment. Oh my God. I I don't know if I like love that term or hate it because it just seems like, like the story is so fucked up. I hate the idea of having like a funny term to associate with it, but I also think your term is right. Well, I don't think the term is funny particularly, and I do think it's accurate insofar as it involves a sleight of hand, kind of in the style of magicians. And what do magicians do other than control our perception of reality, including our perception of our own reality? And Serena Williams' experience with medical gaslighting almost embodies in the flesh Ruiz's definition of medical gaslighting, which she defines as Quote, the interpersonal phenomenon of having one's experience of illness marginalized, including having one's self-reported or presenting symptoms downplayed, silenced, or psychologically manipulated by a clinical provider or healthcare professional. So this is exactly what happened to Serena. She said, I am having these symptoms and I am telling you what they mean. And both the presentation and the interpretation of the symptoms were called into question. And I think a lot of women can relate to some form of experience of medical gaslighting. Like, like even I have been medically gaslit and I am a white, thin, able-bodied young woman. Um, without going into like too much detail here, I had some digestive issues that were long misdiagnosed and weirdly like totally downplayed to the point that my doctor at some points would say like, there's nothing wrong with you. I don't know why you're making up problems. And then on the other hand would go to extremes and be like, actually, I think you have this really intense disease, which luckily I didn't have. And so, yeah, the, the truth was more somewhere in the middle. And now I've been able to like sort out my digestive issues, um, which like frankly just came down to the fact that I am lactose intolerant and nobody ever noticed. And my point is, like, this is nothing compared to the story of Serena Williams, right? And to the stories of so many fat women, black women, disabled women, and women of other intersections of identity that have less privilege than I do. Yeah, and so it's important to keep the intersections in mind, but it's also important to keep the overall pattern that this is something that happens to women more than men in the medical establishment. And in a piece published in The Atlantic, Ashley Fetters makes the argument that the entire industry of alternative medicine, which, you know, can include 
some more helpful things and some less helpful things on the less helpful end of things. I'm imagining somebody like <laughs> Gwyneth Paltrow. Um, but this entire oh industry was built on the back of this history of doctors being dismissive of women's health concerns, especially yeah. around reproduction, pregnancy, childbirth, which forced women effectively to start looking for anything or anybody that might actually listen to their concerns. And so it's medicine's fault that people don't have faith in Absolutely. it. Absolutely. And I will say that that exclusion of women's knowledges, indigenous knowledges, and other forms of knowledge production that don't adhere to the, you know, very rigid model of medicine have led to it's being very difficult to separate the wheat from the chaff when it comes to alternative medicine, the Gwyneth Paltrow's from the actual healers. That's right. And I think here about a case of medical gaslighting along the lines of gender that hits very close to home, which is that when my mother gave birth to my younger brother, who is uh, right now in his teens, she was majorly... Oh, hi, Josue. Yeah, she... <laughs> hi, Josue. Uh, she was majorly <laughs> gaslit by the hospital where she gave birth because she gave birth to her son. Then she took him home. And for a while, she had to battle the hospital over a bill for an abortion where they tried to convince her that she didn't have the baby that <gasps> she had and that she was holding. So she's what? like, I don't know how to prove to you that I had my baby other than... Oh my God, David. It's like habeas corpus, like produce the body. Like it's here. Like I'm, I can just put it on... <laughs> I'll just show up and put it on the table, I guess. Um, Wait, that is so obscene. Yeah, and so there was this protracted battle between my family and the hospital over thousands of dollars that they wanted to charge over this mysterious abortion that never took place. But they were convinced my oh brother my did not God. exist. I'm hoping at least in that case, your mom was not gaslit in the sense of actually having her reality be undermined, right? Wait. Yeah, no, I mean, hard to doubt the existence of like, a kid that's, <laughs> you know, attached to your hip. <laughs> it would be kind of funny if later in life she's like, mm, I, I didn't have you really. <laughs> she's continuing the cycle of gaslighting by convincing Josue that he doesn't exist. Yeah, there is a paper trail of his non-existence. Well, on this note of encouraging David's younger brother to doubt his own existence, just as Socrates would have done, thanks for joining us today. Have a great day. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can email us with questions, feedback, or even requests for live advice at dearoverthink at gmail.com. You can also find us on Instagram and Twitter at overthink underscore pod. We want to thank Anna Koppelman, our production assistant, Samuel P.K. Smith for the original music, and Trevor Ames for our logo. Thanks so much for joining us today. 